Consider this particular series the sum of the AIs. And I've written it out in a bit of a funny way. I've written A1, A2, A3 as normal, but instead of just writing dot, 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 I go A1, A2, all the way up to AN, and then I write AN plus 1, and it keeps on going AN plus 2, AN plus 3, and dot, dot, dot goes on forever. As in, I've sort of pulled out the AN term and written it explicitly. Now, the reason I did this is that I want to talk about the nth partial sum, and the nth partial sum is just the sum of the first n terms. Indeed, when we defined what it meant for a series to converge, what we talked about was that if the limit of the partial sums goes to a limit L, then that's what we mean by a series converging to that value of L. So this nth partial sum was very important to us. But what about everything else? Like, the partial sum goes up to a n, let's give a name to a n plus 1 all the way to the end, and I'll call it the remainder, the r sub n. And then if I want to use summation notation instead, I can sort of collapse this down to saying that the s n here is the sum from 1 up to n, and the remainder is a sum from n plus 1 all the way up to infinity. We sometimes say that we're breaking the series up into a finite portion, the partial sum, and then this infinite tail, the n plus 1, all the way to infinity. Indeed, I can rearrange this one more time if we wish, and we can say that the remainder term is the entire series subtracted off the partial sum. So the question that's really going to motivate us is how so-called big is this error term, this remainder term? Indeed, imagine you go and you compute out S10 or S100, or you have a fast computer and you compute out S1 million. You add up the first million terms. A computer can do that. So then the question is, you've got some value, and is that value really close to the thing it converges to, or is it really far away? And indeed, the answer to that question might depend on your specific discipline, what the standards and uncertainty that you're allowed to have in your specific discipline. But we're going to try to come up with some formula that tells us how bad is this remainder term? How bad is our estimate going to be if we approximate by just taking, say, the tenth partial sum? Now, the way we're going to talk about this is quite related to the integral test. Indeed, I want you to consider some function that I have here in f of x. I have a corresponding sequence which gives me points on that curve. Notice, by the way, that I haven't put the y-axis on the graph. I'm starting some ways out. I'm starting at n, and then I'm going n, n plus 1, n plus 2, and so on. I haven't shown you anything between 1 and n. I'm only showing you n and so on. Now, for these rectangles, I'm going to use a right endpoint to define the height of them. So on the interval from n to n plus 1, the, the, the height of this is going to be a n plus 1. The width is 1, and so what you get is that the area of the first rectangle is a n plus 1, and the second one is a n plus 2, a n plus 3, and so on. So now what I have is this relationship between this geometric concept and my series. I can talk about the remainder, which was the series, but from n plus 1 up to infinity, that's the area of the rectangles. And the way I have drawn it with this positive, decreasing, and continuous function is that the area of this rectangles of the remainder is less than the improper integral from n up to infinity. So I have an inequality here. Okay, I want to do the same trick, but on the other side to get a different inequality to bound the remainder in the other way. So now what I'm going to do is not this, but I'm going to do left endpoints instead. And what this does, if I do left endpoints, it makes all of my rectangles bigger. The first one has an area a n, the second one a n plus 1, third a n plus 2, and so on. But if I look at my remainder formula, my remainder formula only starts at a n plus 1. So this first rectangle that I've drawn, the one with area a n, let's just get rid of that entirely because I just don't care about that. I care about starting a n plus 1. But now if I look at this series, this series is all bigger than the integral starting at n plus plus 1 up to infinity. So I have an inequality on the other side, namely that this remainder term is bigger than the integral from n plus 1 up to infinity. So it's in a sense squashed. It's got the integral from n plus 1 up to infinity on one side, the integral of n up to infinity on the other, and the remainder sits there in the middle of it. So this is a bound. It tells me how bad could my remainder be? Well, it has to be bigger than and less than these two different integrals. So if I want to estimate on my remainder how bad it might be, I can compute these integrals, and that doesn't tell me what my remainder is exactly, but it gives me a reasonable bound that I can use to see whether my estimation is good enough for my particular application.
So as an example, let's consider this series, the sum from 1 up to infinity of 1 over n cubed. Now, I know this series converges. Indeed, if we go back to the first video on the integral test, this is just a p-series, and the p-series converges here because I relate it to the p-integral 1 over x cubed, where p, the 3 here, is greater than 1, and so that we know this improper integral converges, and so too does the series. But what does it converge to? We don't know. The integral test only tells us does it converge or does it diverge. It doesn't tell us what it converges to. So let's suppose we go away and we compute the value of s10. Okay, so let me say that we go away and we're going to compute manually via a calculator, via a computer, the answer to s10, the 10th partial sum. To compute this value of s10, I'm going to go to a very useful website, which is Wolfram Alpha. And Wolfram Alpha is that calculator on steroids that allows you to compute an enormous number of things. And it interprets what you say in a relatively clever way. So for example, we want to do the sum, and we're doing this from the value of 1 up to 10, if I want to figure out the s10, the 10th partial sum. And then of what function am I doing? 1 over n cubed. I hit enter, and it's going to go away. It's going to think about it for a moment, and it spits out that the value approximately is 1.19 Eight. And so that is the value that I'm going to use for my S10. So we've gotten this approximation, S10 is approximately 1.196. Now, what about the remainder? So by this business of comparing it to an integral, the formula we've gotten is that R10, the remainder when you take 10 terms, is something smaller than the integral from 10 up to infinity of 1 over x cubed dx. Well, I can do that integral, so let's just go and consider just that integral. Uh, first, it's an improper integral. So instead of the infinity, I have to pull it out and talk about a limit as t goes to infinity, where I've got this integral from 10 up to t. I can do this particular integral, it's just a power rule, so I keep the limit out the front and I integrate it, I get minus 1 over 2x squared. I'm going to plug in the t, I'm going to plug in the 10, and then because the t's in the denominator, if I take the limit as t goes to infinity, the first term goes away, I'm just left with the second, that is, I just have 1 over 200. So that what tells me a bound on my error. The remainder is something smaller than 1 over 200. So, so what do I know? I'm beginning here with this example, the series that is adding up 1 over n cubed. I have done the s10, so my approximation by adding 10 terms, and I've gotten the value of 1.196. And then I asked, how bad is my remainder? And my remainder is less than 0.005. Now, my series is one of these positive, decreasing ones, that requirement that makes all of this stuff work. So in that case, as I add more terms, if I added some terms from the remainder in, it would only get bigger. So what can I actually say about my final answer, the actual series? Well, it's the approximation, the 1.196, the S10. But then it might be a little bit more than that. It might be all the way up to 0.005 more than that. That's what my remainder is going to be. So I don't know exactly where it lies in that 0.005 range. The remainder estimate doesn't tell me that. It's just an estimate. But I do know that the series is less than the 1.196 plus the 0.005. Now, whether that was good enough for your specific application would depend on what your application was, what kind of uncertainty or error was permissible. But if you didn't like it, you could go better. Instead of computing S10, you could go and compute S100, S1000, S1 billion if you had a really fast computer. That'd all be something that you could choose to do. And your remainder, therefore, would get substantially better as well. So you could get as accurate as you pleased with this kind of method.